So, good morning. I'm Bernd Bräunlich. Uh, this talk title, The Utopia Disaster, uh, is something like a second stage, uh, a development out of uh, 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 co uh, collaborative uh, work with Mariana Christofides, uh, which is to be seen uh, downstairs. I will talk about this work uh, more later on. Uh, the, the Utopia disaster could summarize uh, as a catchphrase the past few decades of broad consensus that all utopias are at an end. In 2007, uh, sociologist Sigmund Baumann wrote that internet research had left him with the impression that the term utopia has mostly been appropriated by holiday, interior design and cosmetics companies, as well as by fashion houses. One could add that it has been exploited in recent years in an all but inflationary way in art exhibitions. The utopia disaster, which sounds as if it had been derived from some uh, contemporary career on the loss of the utopian imagination, was an inscription we discovered on the file dating from 1891 in the Gibraltar government archives. It was in March 2011, in the course of artist Mariana Christofides' work on a cycle entitled Stereoscapes, which hinged on two or more divergent, but at the same time complementary images of reality, that we traveled to Gibraltar to discover the story of two magic lantern slides uh, that we had found. They were for street scene in the Gibraltar of the early 1930s, and but for the frame of the view and the coloring, the subject identical. Except for the image captions, a different one for each, acting as a cue for correspondingly differing interpretations. The outcome of that research was the work Stereoscapes No. 1, a work which is on view here. Uh, at the archives in Gibraltar, we made the chance find of a weighty file. It contained a host of documents on the sinking of the SS Utopia in 1891. On 17th of March, uh, en route from uh, Trieste to New York, she had been due to call at Gibraltar. In stormy weather, the ship collided with a British warship in the bay overlooked by the town, and she sank within a short time. She was carrying 880 passengers, uh, most of them Italian migrants of whom only some 300 were safe. The symbolic power of, of, of the label Utopia Disaster, with its components of idealistic hopes and terrible failure, was a spur for the present joint uh, contribution. The deeper exploration of issues concerning the Mediterranean and migration over the past one and a half years has been a process of constant exchange of the complementary perspective that is characteristic of Mariana's work in general, the transfer to a different medium, has informed the content and structure of this talk, which sets out to examine the Mediterranean's role-changing identity between bridge and boundary. Uh, the Mediterranean as an arena of lively exchange amongst cultures and people, as Baudet described it, and as a wall of water, the delimitation to human action that was in ancient prehistory. A light motif running through the entire talk will be the assimilation past and present of ancient history and mythology and its significance for the growth of European identity and the setting of borders, the part of myth in the attitudes of inclusion and exclusion. Since the uh, Mediterranean has become in recent years a kind of buffer zone of the EU, Hope and desperation in the region have been nowhere so close as in the Strait of Gibraltar. Gibraltar itself, though the rock was a fortress for centuries, is eloquent uh, testimony for, uh, to the Mediterranean as a common social and cultural domain. Its population, numbering some 30,000, is a mixture resulting from manifold currents of migration. Like many other ports of the Mediterranean area in the past, Gibraltar is a site of ethnic pluralism and religious tolerance. But unlike the Trieste of Italo Svevo or the Alexandra of Lawrence Darrell and Constantinus Cavafis, uh, which were communities 
integrated into new nation states, tolerance and pluralism in the little uh, colony prevailed. It even formed the foundation for the ideology of a Gibraltarian nationalism. These features are also a central aspect in family histories, in which personal mixed origins are regarded with pride. In the city, a mixing is praised just 15 kilometers away, on the opposite side of the Strait of Gibraltar, uh, a revival of the non plus ultra, the up to here and not a step further method, message of the pillars of Hercules prevails. In the opposite direction, though, to set uh, some in classical times. For many centuries, to ignore that deterrent taboo amounted to leaving God behind and venturing into the perilous zone. Ruin awaits those who lack respect. Witness Odysseus, who in Dante is encountered in hell. He has become a sinner and passes the pillars under the spell of Curiositas. Until he arrives at the Mount of Purgatory, which would be pictured as situated in the Atlantic Ocean, and where a terrible gale is unleashed and Odysseus must die, as pleased another. In the landmark year 1492, <coughs> The Moors, being expulsed from Spain on the one hand and America being discovered on the other, there's a shift in the axis of deterrence. The sea itself becomes an open space of opportunity. There, the utopias of the early modern age lie Bacon's Nova Atlantis, Moors' Utopia. The notion of sailing beyond the pillars of Hercules embodies for the philosophers of that period. Uh, departure to new worlds and unknown realms of knowledge. The freedom of the seas is like the freedom of thought. This Mare Liberum uh, has found its modern thinker in Karl Schmidt. I quote, uh, the sea remains outside any specific organization of space by or in terms of nation states. It is neither a state territory nor colonial space nor occupiable, he says. In that same year of 1492, the pillars of Hercules turn, the axis of deterrence pivots and whole nine decrees to the south. <coughs> in the battle against the Moors, classical myth becomes a very fall in the greater political propaganda effort. Non plus ultra serves Ferdinand II of Aragon as a motto and a reminder of the decree that applies now that the Emirate of Granada, the last Moorish state in Andalusia, has fallen. Henceforth, Islamic Moors are allowed to settle only beyond the strait. <clears throat> Although soon replaced by a plus ultra under Charles V to symbolize Spain's overseas orientation, the original non plus ultra, interestingly enough, has survived in the arms of one city. The city is Melilla, and the arms to be seen next to the last statue of Franco on Spanish territory that might be noted in the city's main square. Melilla, neighboring Sefta, which lies directly opposite Gibraltar, one of the two Spanish exclaves uh, on North African soil. In 2005, it attained dubious notoriety when 12 refugees died in the attempt to cross the border installations with homemade ladders. In 2003, the EU had ratified a program to combat illegal immigration based on the premise of the concept of the virtual maritime border. Behind this label lurked the intention of moving the border control out as far as the North African shores. Sefta and Melilla are important outposts in this process, parts of a program, a system of surveillance of the sea that returns to the mythology of ancient Greece and Rome in the terms it finds for its operations against illegal immigrants. While in the regions where these myths originated, Greece and Cyprus, such operations are referred to in more prosaic terms as epichiesis cupa, that is Operation Broom, the European centers of power set uh, their sights somewhat higher and, as if searching for a common European legitimation, take to archaic narratives and the supply of figures out of Greek and Roman mythology, such as Hera, Chason, Triton, Poseidon, or Odysseus. 
Does that make those responsible, simply enthusiastic players of martial computer games unaware of the possible symbolic significances, or is there rather more underlying their choice? Whatever the answer, it strikes me as interesting that consistently the lenders of their names are either deities that rule the sea or humans who venture onto the high seas. True, the, the, the latter are heroes, but they are roundly punished for it, and always there is a resonance of censure for hippies, for the transgression of divine laws and for having offended divine will. Telling me, Ulysses was the name chosen for the first of these maritime operations, in which the strait and the waters of the Canary Islands in the Atlantic were patrolled. The choice of deities linked directly with the sea may, of course, be explained simply uh, by the Petros being maritime. But Hera was taking recourse to, for the most recent large scale operations, is not the most complied of sponsors then. The sole source for her link with the sea is Virtus Aeneid, the Roman national epic. Hera, the Latin Juno, is Aeneas's great enemy. The obstacles keep him fleeing from Troy, from reaching his fate defined goal, Rome, before he can become its founder as the forefather of the Etruscan people. And she stops at nothing. Great Aeolus, she says, a race with me at war, now sails towards Italy, hurl far and wide, and strew the waves with dead. Whether intentionally or not, those responsible by the European authorities are availing themselves of a metaphorical system that has its charge of significance. To make use of Greek mythology is always also to draw on something that has been an important factor in shaping Europe's identity and the building block of demarcation against non-European cultures. One has to look no further than virtuous tribute to Roman power and greatness to find the first use of such demarcation against North Africa and Asia. Aeneas takes the route sailed by Odysseus not long before, but with two crucial differences. Aeneas lands at Actium and Carthage. This uh, effectively redraws the mythical map with altogether new contours by inscribing Roman history into it. For Actium, read dominion over Cleopatra, Egypt, and the Orient. For Carthage, dominion over Dido, the Phoenicians, and the Orient. For thousands of years, European empires drew their justification from being successors to the Roman Empire. Yet, whenever a European nation's identity was to be established, parts of that history would be blanked out. The contributions made by Asia and North Africa to the intellectual heritage of the ancient world. Egyptians and Phoenicians were swept under the carpet of history in order to purge one's pedigree of undesirable ancestors. Martin Bernal's Black Athena, a heretical, famously controversial piece of writing against the Eurocentric view of classical antiquity, attempted to provide proof of that tendency. Though undeniably exaggerated in its bias, the book is as surely an eye-opener as to how far ideological or racist aspects determine historiography and cultural studies and can thereby falsify the picture of an entire era of civilization. In Germany, for example, uh, an idealized image of the Greeks was a large factor, at least in the first phase of the elaboration of the national consciousness. The perception widely held here among poets and thinkers around 1800 of Greece and Germany as kindred spirits arose from the political powerlessness of the German petty states as separate from dominant romance and formed France. This purged, sterile image of Greece remained a definitive factor in the German education system, cemented there by the classical grammar schools. The original aim of educating the individual toward, toward uh, political freedom turned into its own travesty and an anti-humanitarian aristocraticism of intellect. Walter Benjamin had already published it, it, it against it, published, I'm sorry, published against it in 1931, writing, a consideration of classical antiquity that has nothing to say about slavery cannot be regarded as definitive. 
His attitude banished humanity from the public domain of political activity and made it entirely the privilege of the private sphere. <coughs> Within Germany, the separation of culture and politics was a stumbling block, both so uh, socially and politically. For her foreign affairs, the notion of the superiority of German culture and the sense of mission were few for German aggression, and the more so with the foundation of the Reich and its rise to strength from 1870 on. Thus, the First World War was waged as German culture's battle against Western civilization. Contempt for politics, that education to be unpolitical in the name of the ideals of humanism, however, was to have no small, to have no small share in the failure of the educated class in the face of barbarism, uh, of national socialism, later on. <clears throat> Integration of the German Empire in the 19th century, the identity of the emerging structure under initially highly equivocal frontiers, was bolstered by ideological segregation from what lay without. The mechanisms at play in the process of European unification are not so different. The process rests upon the construction of an idea and territory, territorial unity of Europe, and again upon her segregation from that without. In order to establish external European frontiers, there has to be talk of assaults on these frontiers and of the need to protect them. Migration becomes a security policy issue that has to be combated along with organized crime and ter uh, terrorism. Enter the Mediterranean Sea in this context as a line of demarcation, and seafaring in itself suffices to constitute a border violation. It amounts to a return to archaic prehistory when the sea set the limit to human endeavor. It is an apparent step into the unfitting and immoderate, as Hans Blumenberg elaborates in his essay, Schiffbruch mit Zuschauer, Shipwreck with Onlookers. For the classic critique of civilization, the sea was always suspect. What could have motivated the step from terra firma to the seas, if not weariness of nature's meager provisions, the long and craving gaze for abundance and luxury? In this mental scenario, shipwreck is something of a legitimate consequence of seafaring. The wreck of the utopia had onlookers whose reports are kept at the archive. But how is the perspective of today's EU onlookers and the image they have of shipwreck composed? Here too, shipwreck appears as the legitimate consequence of going to sea, and with migration criminalized, the death of the refugees is seen as regrettable, but accepted as normal. The European Commission cultivates a vocabulary of living under threat that has all the air of having been inspired by the centuries of Rome's defensive battle on the Rhine and Danube. If talk is of growing migrant pressure on the external EU borders of mass migration, search and invasion, then myths are being invoked, which in the shape of collective fallacies generate social cohesion and have often had calamitous effects through history. Verbal representations of migration should therefore be salvaged from the realms of myth and be brought back down to earth. And the facts, as Saskia Sassen demanded as early as uh, 1996, be considered as part of the process of globalization, of the internationalization of the economy and of labor. One-sided narratives obstruct one's view of reality. To return then to Gibraltar. Of course, national consciousness, there too, only arose out of an act of demarcation. In this case, a hard and fast one. Between 1969 and 1985, Spain under Franco had the border crossing between Gibraltar and Spain closed. During, uh, during those years, the Gibraltarians had an enhanced sense of sharing a common destiny, in particular with relations to Great Britain cooling off at the same time. After the border was closed, Thousands had left their home to live and work in London. Their experiences there of being second-class Britons strengthened their motivation to discover their own character, which is based on mixture. The search continues, 
On our visits to the government archives, we encounter lively activity. Local uh, historians and amateur genealogists in a constant stream, and even the most fragile documents are freely accessible. Genealogies are an age-old means of bestowing to the past in the world and to people in order, and of establishing relations. We read and work on Virgil's Aeneid. Their Virgil has the set himself a fundamental problem, namely how to represent an oriental and aggressor on italic soil as a proto-Roman, a dangerous precipice which he skillfully circumnavigates by availing himself of of another tradition, according to which the forefather of the Trojan kings originated from Italy and wandered to Troy via Crete. One of the two texts forming part of Mariana Christophides' work is Deriscape number one ends. In these stories, desired traits are emphasized, unfavorable, once suppressed, and where memory has darkened, colors, largely in milder shades, apply to lighten the former. The glass transparencies are likely to be the ones rejected editions of reality, <coughs> sorted out parallel landscapes that would paradoxically become the point of departure for my exploration. Paradoxically, because the pictures in themselves are, if anything, nondescript, but pre precisely because of this, they leave space for a story to be begun. Images that achieve depth, as the stereoscopes widespread in the 19th century did, into which the title Stereoscapes alludes, which imitate a three-dimensional vision by juxtaposing two slightly staggered views. Christophides works with displacement, with shift and transformation in different media. Magic lantern glass lights become stereoscopes, are translated to text and depart along the tracks of the depicted matter, but also the support of the medium in photographic history. Thus, she creates highly ramified family trees, a genealogy of images. She is not in search of definitive complete histories, so that is the reason she does not give the few other apparatus that would prescribe a way of seeing. Its place is taken by the two texts that facilitate this kind of spatial vision by offering each a different prospect. The parents of the work, called the straight, which you can see also downstairs, likewise create a space for seeing. Though taken in the present, there is to them an aura of time distance. As in the stereoscope, viewers take their positions before the picture and direct their gaze at some vis-a-vis, -vis, which as an object is closed, but the pictorial content of which suggests remote distance. The introduction of st to stereoscapes puts it like this. In front of the entrance to the building, evidently a shop, a young man stood, watching, as I was, what was most likely a staged scene, or, to be more precise, the act of exposing a photograph that was being taken on the level with me. An interaction of proximity and distance that is integral to every kind of reception. It implies nothing other than to discover in history and cultural studies diaphanous links to create a rapport through parallels transposed in time. <laughs>